Thank you for joining us for the online version of the traditional worship service here at the Central Presbyterian Church in Fort Smith, Arkansas. This is a welcoming, affirming, inclusive community full of people at every point you can imagine on the spectrum, and so you're welcome, whether you're here full of strong faith or a lot of doubts and questions or somewhere in between, you're welcome, and you're in good company. We're glad you joined us. This service will include the Lord's Supper, and so we invite you to be prepared to join with us wherever you are. So maybe pause the video and prepare by getting some bread or roll and some juice or wine, and then my prayer of consecration will include the elements that you have gathered for this service too. <clears throat> if you are in the area, we do serve communion on Sunday mornings from 11 to 12 uh, by drive through and we try to do it in the safest way possible with a reach extender and wearing masks and gloves and things. So if you can and if you'd like to, come by between 11 and 12 for communion. We also have other ways of meeting together. There are Zoom classes. I have a class on Sunday mornings. We have Monday morning seekers by Zoom, and we have wine or wine down Wednesdays. That's just a fellowship time and others. So if you'd like to be included in any of those, just let the church know, and we would be happy to include you with a Zoom link. Well, we want to be prepared to receive everything that will be offered in this time of worship. So it's helpful to take just a moment right now, right at the beginning, to set our intention, to ask ourselves, why did I turn this on? What do I need to receive? So let's just take a moment to set our intentions. 
then in order to be fully present to this sacred moment, it's helpful to take time to become mindfully present by centering ourselves. We're going to do that with a deep breath, followed by our normal breathing and bringing our full attention to that breathing, which somehow quiets us down and kind of makes a space for the spirit. So let's do that together. Let's take a deep breath. And then let's just bring our attention to our normal breathing. Amen. We come so God can teach us goodness and love for each person. We will celebrate God's love by having the same compassion as God. We come so Jesus can lead us into the lives of service and obedience. We will celebrate Jesus' hopes by putting others before ourselves. We come so the Spirit can help us to empty ourselves for God and those around us. We will celebrate the Spirit's peace by sharing our lives with theirs. Let us pray. O oh, incomprehensible creator, if we could conceive all the worlds that exist, the stars in their courses, the galaxies without number, they would be less than your kingdom within us, the place of freedom from place, the time of freedom from time. On this day, we thank you for allowing us the priceless gift of experiencing this marvelous world. May the thanks we express with our lips reflect the thanks we feel in our hearts. Amen. <laughs>
When we confess our failures to live up to the standards that we believe in, we do not do so with the sense of shame, but with the hope that reminding ourselves of our high calling is part of growing spiritually. So let us confess how we have missed the mark, confident in God's mercy. Let us pray. O oh God, we hear the call in scripture not to grow weary with well-doing. We confess that with all the bad news swirling around us, we do grow weary. We, have, we are called to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself for our sakes. We confess that we sometimes wish for vengeance instead of for redemption of those who oppose us. We know that we should seek your kingdom and its justice. We confess our need to seek you as the living water for our thirsty souls. Help us by your spirit to be your authentic disciples. Amen. Let us take a moment in silent prayer so that we can confess our sins to God. Hear this good news. God is at work in you. Live this truth. God's grace is more than enough for whatever you carry. Know that you are forgiven, loved, and free. We will live this truth. God's grace is more than, what, than enough for whatever we carry. Know that you are forgiven, loved, and free. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of poets, storytellers, and prophets, from ancient times you provided wisdom through the narratives of the people of Israel. They drew strength and courage from them. May we do the same as we hear the stories again so many centuries later in our time of wandering and thirst. Amen. Our first reading is from the First Testament, the Hebrew Bible, Exodus 17, 1 through 7. This is the part of the story in which, after having been set free from slavery in Egypt, the people of Israel experienced deprivation in the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. Let us listen for God's word to us. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your staff, or take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not?
Our gospel reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, starting with verse 23. So let us listen again for God's word to us. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regarded John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said, The same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. These are the words of Scripture. Thanks be to God. You know, sometimes when I've had to go through a particularly difficult circumstance, I've told myself, just think, in 24 hours, this will be behind you. I found myself looking that way at 2020. There will be a time when we look back on this year with all of its calamities. Let us hope that we will be in a better condition in the future than we are now. It's not just the year 2020 that is in a state of significant change. It's perhaps only one year in the dawn of a new era for the church. Now, if that sounds grandiose, consider this. Author and Professor Phyllis Tickle, in her book The Great Emergence, recounted a metaphor that was offered by Anglican Bishop Mark Dreyer, who noticed that every... 500 years or so, the church has had what he called a giant rummage sale. By that metaphor, he meant this. At about 500-year intervals, quote, the empowered structures of the institutional Christianity, whatever they may be at the time, become an intolerable constraint that must be shattered so that renewal and new growth may occur. Well, here is a sketch of those 500-year events. About 500 years after the birth of the church, as the Roman Empire was crumbling, Pope Gregory the Great established the system of monasteries which were to prove essential in seeing the church through the medieval Dark Ages. About 500 years later, in the 11th century, there was what we now call the Great Schism, in which Western Catholic Christianity and Eastern Orthodox Christianity went their separate ways. About 500 years later, in the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation was born. We date the start of the Protestant Reformation at October 31st, 1517, the day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis on the door of the Wittenberg Castle in order to initiate uh, an open debate. And we are, as of 2017, 500 years after that event. Phyllis Tickle noticed that at each of these crucial moments of change, the question of authority was crucial. Who gets to say what's right and what's wrong? Who gets to define orthodoxy? During the Protestant Reformation, there were debates about authority conducted in essays by the primary protagonists. John Calvin, famously carried on a debate with Cardinal Sadoletto. The Cardinal claimed that the Roman Church had kept the faith 
for 1,500 years. Calvin argued that the, it was the reformers who could lay a claim to a more authentic faith precisely because their version was more ancient. Calvin traced it all the way back to Augustine as the correct interpreter of scripture. The question of authority was being argued utilizing antiquity. Whoever could lay claim to the most ancient version of faith was correct. We'll come back to that. Authority was the question that Jesus' opponents put to him. Now the timing is important. Jesus had just ridden into the city on that donkey colt and went directly to the center of authority, the temple, and had shut it down, at least symbolically, at least for several hours. He was, by that a action, taking on the high priest and the chief priests and the ruling council, all of whom belonged to the aristocratic class. He told them that they had made the house of prayer into a den of thieves. Thieves hid their loot in their dens. The temple was the central bank, the repository of all the records of the debts that peasants had acquired and of all the taxes taken from them. So the challenge to Jesus was, what right do you have to challenge our authority? And Jesus cleverly answered their question with a question of his own. Jesus had been a member of John the Baptist's movement for a while, and though he parted company with John, he had learned a great deal from him. So he was in a position to know that the leadership who was challenging him were not among the crowds who came to be baptized by John, repenting of the ways they'd been unfaithful to the covenant. John had been executed by Herod Antipas, but many people believed that he was a prophet sent by God. So Jesus challenged his challengers to put their cards on the table. John's baptism. What authority was it based on? Was it from God or just a human invention? Crowd consciously, they declined to say. So Jesus also declined to say where his authority came from. Then Jesus told them a parable that at first looks like a non sequitur, but when you look at it carefully, it does address the question of authority. It's about two sons. The father asks them to work in the field. One says yes, but does not work. The other says no, but changes his mind and does do the work. Now, there's one thing we might miss about this parable. Both sons, actually, dishonor their father. Saying yes, but not following through, dishonors your father's authority. Saying no also dishonors your father's authority, even though you later change your mind and obey. So both have dishonored the father, undermining his authority. Neither one is without blame. But Jesus' question is not which of the two honored his father, but which of the two did the will of his father. And clearly it was the first one who said no, but later did the work, who did the will of his father. Jesus then applied the parable to his opponents. He said that the people who were actually doing the will of God were not those who could talk a good talk, but the ones who were faithful in their behavior. The contrast is between the people who, as he said elsewhere, sit in Moses' seat, who had the places of honor in the temple, and alternatively, the lowly peasants. From the temple that he had just symbolically shut down, they read the scrolls of the law and they quoted Moses, but they were simultaneously defrauding the poor of their last denarius. Jesus pointed out that the prostitutes and tax collectors had believed John's message and repented. Let's think about that. Why would a good Jewish woman become a prostitute? Absolute economic destitution is the answer. And what do tax collectors do when they repent? Return the money they have defrauded the people of. The prostitutes can go back to being the people they want to be when reparations have been made and they can afford their daily bread again. 
But the point to notice is that Jesus emphasized right action, not right words, as establishing a claim to legitimacy, meaning authority. One son said the right word, yes, but his yes was vacuous. The other son said wrong words, but his actions were the main thing. Let us close the circle. We began by reflecting, re reflecting on our times as disrupted times of change. Whether or not there is any substance to the idea of a 500-year repeating pattern, nevertheless, it is obvious to everyone that we are in a time of change. I believe this is not bad news, at least not all bad news. There's good news here, too. The good news is that we in the church are newly awake to the importance of right action. We see in a new and more significant way that following Jesus was never supposed to be about merely repeating creeds correctly. Following Jesus was not supposed to be saying the correct yes, but actually going out and doing the work into the field, doing the work of God. And that work includes doing justice, making sure that the prostitutes do not have to resort to that vocation to put food on the table, and making it clear that oppressive systems like defrauding the poor must not be tolerated. We are making the same argument that Calvin made to Cardinal Sadoletto, only we are pushing the question of antiquity back even further than Calvin did. We have come to see that the authentic faith is not defined by the theologians of the fourth century, like Augustine, but is the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus himself proclaimed. The gospel is indeed what the word gospel means, good news, because of the way it involves liberation. First, spiritual liberation. Jesus taught us that God is not honored by temple rituals or the readings of right words, but by the spirituality of belovedness manifesting itself in compassion and the quest for justice. Jesus' message is that even prodigal sons and daughters, even lost sheep, are still objects of God's love, the God who is our heavenly father, mother, who watches over us. So let's make it personal. The good news is that we are beloved by God, who's not out to condemn us, but to lure us to goodness, to encourage us to do the next right thing, to embrace each other without judgment across all lines and borders that would separate us and to create beloved communi communities of mutuality the second liberation is that these spiritually liberated communities become incubators of ministries of compassion and mercy, bridges of reconciliation, advocates for justice, and channels of liberation from oppression. The gospel is good news to the poor, to the marginalized, and to the excluded. Well, 2020 is not over yet. and. What is ahead for us, we do not know. And there's no guarantee that things will not get worse before they get better. But we believe that we are part of a story that is longer than this year and bigger than this nation. We are part of God's story. So let's take our place in our watch, in our generation, faithfully doing the work that God has called us to do and in which we find our shalom, our greatest joy. And now let us affirm the faith that gives us that hopeful vision, and we will do that again in the words of the Iona community. So let us say what we believe. We believe that God is present in the darkness before the dawn, in the waiting and uncertainty where fear and courage join hands, Conflict and caring link arms, and the sun rises over barbed wire. We believe in a with us God who sits down in our midst, 
to share our humanity. We affirm a faith that takes us beyond the safe place into action, into vulnerability, and in the streets. We commit ourselves to work for change and put ourselves on the line to bear responsibility, take risks, live powerfully, and face humiliation, to stand with those on the edge, and to choose to live and be used by the Spirit for God's new community of hope. Well, now it's time to come to God in prayer for the needs of the world, including the climate and the church, and for people in particular need. And so in order to be fully present to this time of prayer, let's just begin with a deep breath. Oh God, even in this strange year of 2020 with everything going on, we still have reasons to be grateful. So we come to you with our prayers of gratitude. We're grateful just to be alive right now, to be conscious in this moment, to be able to receive spiritual food even through virtual means. And we're thankful for the community that we're a part of, even though we're distanced right now. And when we see each other in these virtual ways at Zoom meetings, we know we miss each other, and so we know there's a lot of love there. And so for that love, for those connections, for the hope that we will be back together in some future day when it's safe, we give you thanks. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, we lift up our hearts in prayer for the world and for the world that is full of suffering right now. So many parts of the world are having such a terrible t time now with the second wave of the COVID-19 coronavirus. And so we lift up all of those who are sick or suffering, people who are caring for them and their families, people who are separated because of isolation. We lift up all of the people who have lost their jobs or have been diminished economically in other ways because of this pandemic. And we pray for them and for our economy and the economies of the world. We lift up our hearts in prayer for the leaders of the world and their decisions that are so important in trying to keep people safe and at peace. So we lift up all these concerns. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And O oh God, we lift up our hearts in prayer for those who are suffering in other and normal ways. We think of our homeless population uh, here in Fort Smith and in every major city. And we think about people who are struggling with addiction, people who are trying to maintain recovery, people who are in conditions of challenges to their mental health, people who are feeling uh, discriminated or isolated uh, for any number of reasons. And we lift up to you our country that's in such an upheaval because of the ways our systems have let people down, especially people of color. And we pray for our country. We pray for solutions that are deep and that go to the root of the problems and find ways to make them better. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our country and our planet, and so many people are in harm's way of terrible storms, hurricanes, fires that are out of control, and a planet that seems to be experiencing uh, a catastrophe right in front of our eyes, and so many unwilling to address it as the scientists tell us we must. So we pray for every aspect of the climate crisis that we're in and ask for wisdom and a better commitment to finding solutions. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church around the world and our Presbyterian branch of that church, and we pray for our congregation here in Fort Smith. Even in these days when we're separated uh, because of the virus, make us fruitful, we pray. Thank you for the, those who are tuning in and connecting with us in virtual ways. Bless them with the spiritual food that they need and sustain them as we are separated now. And help us as our ministries of compassion and mercy continue. Bless the Citizens Climate Lobby and PACE and the commitment we have to feeding people through the sack lunch program and the muffins and all the ways we try to be uh, your hands and feet here in the River Valley. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Oh God, we pray for those among us who need you in a special way. We lift up the family and friends of David Harp that are still suffering with the grief of his, the loss of him. We pray for Means Wilkinson and his family, for Jeff's sister Joyce and Betty Stutz, for Robert McAfee and Pastor Forte, for Cliff Chilling and Mike Wade, for Susan and Ken Cowan and David and Jan Witt, for Jerry Carson, for the Mackey family, Linda Parr. And we also lift up Kay Olson and Betty Jo Weary, Peggy Sabs and Mary Ann Lyon, Jane and Daryl Baker, Gloria Miles, May Barlow, Barbara Clark, Sharon Hayden, and Marilyn Rausch and Barry Law. And now we take a moment in silence to lift up the names of those who we haven't named aloud but who we know need you in a special way. So hear our prayer. O oh God, these and all of our prayers we offer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Even though we cannot meet together physically, we know that we are a family. And it is important to keep supporting the family until we meet up again. So let us remember to be faithful with our stewardship. As we come to the celebration of the Lord's Supper, I invite you to gather the elements that you have prepared, the bread and the cup, and join with us in this sacred meal. Come to me, Jesus said, all of you who are weary and carrying burdens. So this table is for all of us without exception. May the God of truth be with you. Let us offer our hearts to God. We empty them of all of our desires so God might fill them with humility. We will join in praising our God in these moments. One mind, one heart, one love, we will offer thanksgiving to our God. So let us pray. If there is any beauty around us, God of glory, it is because of the creation you crafted out of nothingness. Seahorses and coral reefs, tree-lined mountain slopes, fields ripe with wild berries, falling stars streaking through the night skies, all was imagined for those in human form named by you as your children. Women and men came again and again to help us remember your mercy. Poets, prophets, and storytellers pointed the way. Most of all, we remember Jesus, whose only interest was in being obedient to you. We join little children and wise elders folks who are humble and those who serve in proclaiming your goodness. Holy, holy, holy are you, God, our teacher. All creation is completed by your love. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who models obedience for us. Hosanna in the highest. If there is any holiness, it is found in you, God of truth. If then there is any hope, it is found in Jesus, who came to serve the arrogant with humility, the fearful with faith, and the oppressed with justice. As we seek to have the same mind and heart, as we seek to be obedient and humble, we proclaim that mystery we call faith. Christ died, confronting the powers of oppression. Christ's spirit has risen in our hearts and in our community. Christ comes to us in every moment by the Spirit, disguised as our life. If then there is any sharing, O God, it is here in these moments and with these sisters and brothers where your Spirit is poured out upon us. Here the brokenness of your heart strengthens us for our faltering service so we may bend down to lift up all who have been knocked down by injustice and fears.
Here, the cup of humility nourishes our hearts and souls, so we may remember those whose names have been forgotten by the arrogant and uncaring. And when there is only your time, when we are gathered with our sisters and brothers around your table, we will join in singing your praises forever, O God in community, holy in one. Amen. On the night before he met with death, Jesus came to the table with those he loved, and he took bread, and he gave thanks to the God of all creation, and he broke the bread among his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this remembering me. And when the supper had ended, he took a cup of wine, and he gave thanks to the God of all creation, and he shared the cup among his disciples, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood, sealed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So these are the gifts of God for the people of God. So let us receive them with joy. So I invite you now to take the bread that you have prepared and breaking a piece, remember, this is the body of Christ given for you. And taking the cup that you have prepared, remember, this is the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Let us have the same mind, O oh God. We will see each person as God's child. Let us have the same justice as Jesus. We will stand with each person who struggles. Let us have the same hope as the Spirit. We will put others before us in all we do. Amen. Wherever you are going, God is sending you there. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose for you being there. Christ, who indwells you, has something he wants to do through you where you are. So believe that and receive his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.